Okay. We have the signal to go ahead. Technology is caught up. Our job rotation uh, was widely adopted in American industry uh, with significant results. Uh, obviously, a person who's doing one thing repetitively day after day gets greatly relieved when he shifts to something else. But the obvious eventually occurred, if you get eight boring jobs to do, it will just take you eight times as long to get bored, but then you are eventually bored. And the same thing happens again. So that in job rotation, uh, they got quicker increases in productivity. In general, the increases weren't as high and they didn't last as long. Again, emphasizing the fact that there's no permanent solution, apparently, to this problem, that you have to be prepared with a set of alternatives. Now, the next conceptual step was the first really radical step which occurred that began to involve systemic thinking. It was the recognition that the problem arose out of the nature of work, that work had been designed for machines and given to people to do. And people began to ask, the incredibly simple question that nobody had thought of before. What would work look like if it were designed for a human being as opposed to a machine? Would it be the simplest task you could possibly think of? The answer was no. It would be the most complicated task a person could do. And that's moving in exactly the opposite direction. Putting tasks together to get a job that's as complex as a person can handle. That was called work enrichment, which became the third major move. When this hit 10 to 15 years ago, great excitement, for example, the Motorola plant in the southwest in the Sun Belt, which produced walkie-talkies called the Page Boy, just tore out the plant, the inside of the plant entirely, and rearranged it. Every employee in the plant had a workstation. All the parts required to make a walkie-talkie were brought to that station, and the individual employee made the total walkie-talkie. The whole thing. He packaged it, put a card in it with his name and phone number, and said to the customer, if you have any complaints, please call me directly. Wrapped it up and sent it out. And Motorola claimed between a 30 and a 60 percent increase in the output per worker per day. Now this kind of thing began to happen all over. Now if you're building a skyscraper, you don't get one man and have them assemble it, of course. <laughs> the principle of work enrichment was to give the individual the largest single task that he could accommodate to. <clears throat> that didn't mean it was necessarily the whole job. He might not assemble an automobile, but he might do an entire sub-assembly alone. Okay, now what happened with work enrichment? Well, we suddenly had people making a television set from beginning to end. Uh, a lot of appliances began to be made this way. It's a fairly complicated sub-assembly. It's a lot more interesting. But how long can you go assembling a television set before you get bored? Well, a lot longer than you can by soldering two pieces of wire together but eventually you're going to get bored doing that, and that's exactly what happened. It took longer to get bored. In the meantime, productivity tended to go up further. It eventually leveled off, and then became prosaic. Productivity started to get down. Next idea is perfectly obvious. Why don't we combine job rotation and work enrichment? So you get a person doing a real complicated job, and then before he gets bored, you move him to another one. But the trouble is that when you got enriched work, it requires a lot of training before a person can do it. I can't shift you from making a television set to a refrigerator without training, or a radio to a TV set without training. So now the next step which became involved was the requirement, if you're going to rotate enriched jobs, you must bring in career planning <coughs> and education and training as an integral part of the work plan. So you get combined rotation and enrichment 
plus personal planning or career planning. Education and training come in as an integral part of the workforce. To an incredible extent, I don't know how many of you saw the article in the New York Times just about two weeks ago about the involvement of corporations in education. The largest educational in the institution in the United States today, outside of the federal government, which I'm, I'm leaving out, is IBM. It's much bigger than the University of California. <coughs> AT&T is bigger in its educational activity than the eight colleges in the Ivy League. They're having to engage in education and training because of the complexity of the work and constant technological changes require constant updating of their workforce. Whether it's the selling workforce, the production workforce, the materials handling workforce, so that education and training are demanded for two reasons. One is the rapid rate of change in technology, and the other is the rotation of people through different tasks. Well, this can only get you so far, too. The next step was the second major radical transformation involving systemic thinking. They said, you know, what we're doing is designing work that's enriched for the individual. What we have always taken for granted is that the unit worker is the person. Isn't that reductionist thinking? What is the largest unit for which we could design work? And then what is the largest task we could give to that unit? You see the difference? In work enrichment, you still take the individual person and say, what's the most complicated task? <laughs> But in the next step, you say, what's the largest group that I can treat as an entity to which I can assign work? And this gave rise to a concept called the semi-autonomous work group. This is a group which is set up. It's given a task as complicated as that group can perform. These, tasks, these groups will be anywhere from 8 to 15 people. And the understanding is now combining concepts from work structuring. All we're going to do is negotiate with that group on what we expect it to put out. How it does it is the group's business, not ours. Management will be available as a resource called on by the group when the group wants to after the negotiation of target outputs. But the means of production will be left entirely in the hands of the group. The organization of the group will be left in their hands as well. That's why it's called autonomous. The reason it's semi-autonomous is they do not set the objectives themselves. The objectives are set in negotiation with management. The famous plant built by Volvo, probably the pioneering one, is the automotive plant at Kalmar, in which a whole new factory was designed that has no production lines, no assembly line in it, and yet it makes automobiles. It's built like a honeycomb with a set of workstations with groups of 8 to 15 people, each of which do a very complicated subassembly. How they organize within the group is entirely up to them. They can rotate jobs, enrich jobs, anything they want to do inside those groups. They can negotiate the exchange of people between groups or the exchange of tasks between groups. Anything the two groups that agree to that doesn't affect anybody else is fine. And Kalmar is an absolutely unbelievable factory. You don't see things rushing down with people in there operating like Charlie Chaplin. It's an extremely relaxed atmosphere in which you can talk in a normal conversational tone. It's the only automotive factory I've ever seen like that. People are clean in beautiful uniforms, friendly and engaged in conversations with each other. And they turn out a third more automobiles per person than any conventional assembly plant does. It was a radical transformation. Now the next step brings us up to virtually the present, right on top of it. You see what the next step is, we now got the worker in there designing his own work within this group, subject to certain constraints of objectives. Why can't we have him 
have some say about the output as well as the means, the ends as well as the means. And when we ask that question, what we're saying is, why can't the worker have a say in all decisions which affect him within the system? And that raises the issue of participation, which is the frontier that we're on right now. Now, participation is itself <coughs> graded in three ways. The most elementary form of participation is communication. And so you'll find in the management literature today a great deal of discussion of communication. We have learned that communication down and communication up and communication across are three different things. And a system which does one thing well will not necessarily do the other two well. I had an interesting experience along these lines. A number of years ago, I urged the CEO of a major corporation to start communicating more effectively with the entire workforce. It was a complicated problem because there were 11 plants spread around the country and a number of sales offices. But he thought this would be a good idea, and so he organized a two-month tour every year in which he spoke to every employee of the company, 35,000 of them. There would be a meeting that would last at least two hours in which he'd come in with shirt sleeves and no tie. If for each shift in the plan, it was a three-shift operation. And give them a State of the Union talk. And then for at least an hour, throw the floor open for questions or discussion or objections, like a stockholder meeting, but with the employees. It was extremely well received. A lot of praise for his spending his time doing that kind of thing. And it showed in increased productivity. I got a call from him one day, the day after a major strike had been called on that company. He said, the conversation went like this, he said, God damn you. <laughs> he said, I just came back from a two month tour of this place. I spoke to every worker that we employ. I wasn't back a week when they called a national strike on me on an issue that was never raised in any of those meetings. How do you explain that? Well, how would you explain that? I said, because you've organized those meetings to enable you to communicate to the worker, not to enable the worker to communicate to you. He said, what do you mean? I throw the floor open for a discussion. I said, their expectation of what you expect from them is very different than what would happen if you asked them to organize a meeting in which you were in the audience. If you want to know what they think, you let them organize the meeting. Don't, you don't organize it for them. Well, he later organized meetings that way, where the workers call a meeting and invite whatever management they want. And I can tell you, those are entirely different meetings than the meeting the manager calls to communicate to the workers. In the university, the meetings we call of our students to communicate to them are entirely different than the meetings the students call to communicate to us. So we've begun to learn that communication has multiple dimensions. And in a sense, this meeting has certain communication objectives that we'll talk about as we get ready for tomorrow. Now, communication is the weakest form of participation. The next highest form is consultation. In consultation, the essential element is that a, a person in a position of responsibility <laughs> asks for the opinion and advice of those who will be affected by the decision he has to make. He's not bound in any way to follow it. But what normally will occur is after having gotten the advice, if he doesn't follow it, he will explain why he did. This presumably will educate the person to provide him with advice. If it fails, it will educate the person who didn't take the advice. But consulting is exactly what it says. You consult with somebody, you don't give them the responsibility for making the decision. That still stays with the person who had the responsibility originally. There's been an increased amount of consultation as we begin to realize that increasingly we have managers supervising people who know more about what they're doing than the manager does. 
There are very few corporate executives, for example, who will go into a computer programmer and tell them how to program a program. Most managers don't know enough about computers to tell a programmer how to do his work. And therefore, the programmer can tell the manager a hell of a lot more about how that job ought to be done and what equipment ought to be had and how it ought to be organized than the manager can. And so it's been natural to increase consultation as the special knowledge and skills of subordinates have increased and have gradually exceeded that knowledge and skill of the manager. That doesn't mean the manager doesn't know things they don't know. But he doesn't know things which he needs to know in order to supervise them effectively, and therefore he can't supervise them unless he consults with them. Let me give you a very simple example. Uh, about two years ago, we started a project at Alcoa, Tennessee, which is the largest installation in the Alcoa system. It's a flat rolling uh, operation in which there's a big smelter and two flat rolling mills that employ 4,200 people and about 15 smaller supporting plants. It's a huge installation. It's also a very old one. Uh, without going into detail of the changes that occurred of this kind, I just want to tell you about one incident. We started a system uh, relating to consultation with workers. After the first meeting in the pot room, which is one of the critical rooms uh, in the rolling mill, a critical area in the plant, two workers did something in 15 minutes, which saved the, pro the company over two and a half million dollars a year. And what they did was this. The aluminum comes off the end of a rolling mill in a big coil. It can be up to five feet high, and it will weigh a tremendous amount. Now, it normally comes off the end of the line, and it's located, standing up, it's just a cylinder, you know, wrapped around, located on the floor until a forklift truck comes over, picks it up, and takes it over to the storage area. Now, every once in a while, for one reason or another, the forklift truck it gets delayed. And what happens is they got a lineup of these cylinders here, and they have no room to put the new cylinder coming off the end of the, the mill. So they have to move the cylinders that are already there. Well, how do you move a heavy coil of aluminum? How would you do it? Overhead crane. No, no, you don't have it. You just want to move it about uh, six, seven inches, so you can get another coil, you know, a foot. You put your foot against the bottom, you grab a hole at the top, you pull it down so it's on its edge, and you roll it. I mean, that's the way you do a, a carpet, you know, a short carpet or anything like that. Roll the paper. Now, unfortunately, when you do that, what happens to the edge of the aluminum? The, the outer roll, and in perhaps one or two winds, crimps the edge from the weight. Now the customer is buying 60 inches of aluminum, not 59 and a half inches. So 20% of those rolls were returned to the company. And that cost the company about two and a half million bucks a year. Now what these two workers did when consultation began is they went out to the shipping room and got heavy felted paper, which is used to wrap the aluminum on a ship, put down four layers on the floor. That's all they did. And now when you rolled aluminum over four layers of paper, it didn't crimp the edge. Now, I went down to see those two guys and I said, you know, that's a marvelous thing you did. And they were very proud. I said, well, how long have you known about that? They said, about 15 years. <laughs> I said, well, how come you never said anything about it? He said, because those bastards thought they knew everything, and we weren't going to spoil their impression of themselves. <laughs> Last week was the first time they ever asked us a question. <clears throat> so we told them. I said, maybe they'll think twice from here on. Okay, that's a reflection of what happens in consultation. <clears throat> The dignity and self-respect is tremendously increased when people are consulted in this way. The final step, and that's the one we're going to really focus on in here, is something called co-determination.
This is where the employee is given a voice in making the decision. He's a participant in the decision making, not merely a consultant, nor is he merely communicated with about the decision. He has a voice, a vote in the process. Now, this has gone through an evolution too, but what I'm going to show you is a design of a completely participative organization. It's a very radical concept. But it solves a dilemma which has plagued organizational theorists for years. It's interesting to observe that we are a country dedicated and committed to the concept of democracy, right? At least all Americans claim this. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a very clear idea what democracy is. We know a lot about what it isn't, but we don't have a very good idea about what it is. Now, the central idea of democracy is not voting. Hell, the Soviets vote all the time, but we say that's different. Yes, it sure is, but it's not different because of voting. The essential property of a democracy is this. Nobody has control over others unless the others collectively have control over them. It's a circularity of control. There is no ultimate authority in a democracy. That was demonstrated when Nixon was put out of office by the people that he was administering. Circular. It's not linear. Now, a problem arises in industry. In industry, you've got a complex task like building a building or an automobile or a ship. One person can't build a ship, so you have to divide the labor. When you take labor and divide it up, you need coordination. And if you get enough coordinators, then you need a coordinator of the coordinators. And therefore, what we've recognized for a very long time is that you can only organize work hierarchically into a hierarchy. In society, our value is with democracy. How the hell can you produce a democratic hierarchy? Well, we saw no way of doing it. We had to go one way or the other, so what do we do? We organize establishments like the military, like industry, like schools, hierarchically, and say the hell with democracy. The fact is that the institutions within democracies are organized exactly the way a fascist state is. They are autocratic institutions operating within a democracy. And that may not have bothered the conscience of the many people, but it sure bothers the organizational theorists. Wouldn't it be great if we could have democratic organizations within a democracy? Now how can you do it without destroying hierarchy? And if you destroy hierarchy, you destroy productivity. You have to maintain hierarchy. How can you get a democratic hierarchy? Well, we didn't see any way. We said it was impossible. That's a dilemma. Remember what I said about a dilemma? It's a problem you can't solve within the prevailing view of the world. That's exactly right here. We couldn't solve this until we made a break with the fundamental assumption we were making. And the assumption is incredibly simple. Suppose I took six of you, the six of you at that table, and said, I would like you six to go off next door and redesign the organization to see that, okay? Uh, now, I've arranged in advance, there's a table and chairs in there, but no paper, no pencils, no nothing in the room, only a table and chairs, okay? And now you go in there and you start. I'll bet you it won't take two minutes before you come out and ask for something, what we asked for. Paper and pencil, or a chart, or a blackboard. Why? Because it's in cap we are absolutely incapable of talking about organizational structure without having a surface on which to draw it. First thing you got to do is start to draw boxes, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we start to draw the boxes and label them. Now, there's an important thing about a piece of paper. It has only two dimensions, up and down and across, and therefore all discussion of organizations is two-dimensional. Up and down is the flow of authority, 
and across is the division of responsibility. So we got responsibility on the horizontal dimension and authority on the vertical dimension, and there's our concept of organization. Now, can you think of any good reason why an organization has to be two-dimensional? The fact is, there isn't any. The reason that they are is because we insist on representing them on a piece of paper. But give up the piece of paper and go to a third dimension and you can build an, or an organization that's a democratic hierarchy like that. Now, having said that, I want to show you that it can be done, and, and I have to do it on a flat piece of paper. <laughs> so I'm going to have to cheat. You're going to have to bring an additional dimension in by the use of color. Okay? Let's start by taking a very simple hierarchical organization. I'm going to start with a very elementary one. It takes three levels. We'll have three units at each level. We may as well give these names so we can talk about them. <coughs> to preserve the concept of hierarchy, we're going to call him number one. And to designate reporting relationships, I'll call him 1.1, 1.2, and 1.3. Okay? And these three are 1.1.1 and 1.1.2 and 1.1.3. Of course, the organization goes on, but I only need this part to show up, okay? Here's a very elementary organization. Now we got workers in here. And let's keep it simple. These are managers without staff. We got the workers down here who are part of these units. Now, if I'm talking about a company, there are companies that are organized in three levels. The university is. <clears throat> this is university, this is college, and this is department. It's exactly the way a university is constructed. With one big difference. Every educational institution, every corporation has something called a board. Right? At the top of the organization, there's a board which is the ultimate authority. The number one man is normally the CEO, the chief executive officer, and chairman of the board. Okay. So he's a member of this board, and then there are a number of outsiders who serve on that board as well. Now, there's an interesting thing about boards in the corporate world. <clears throat> I don't know of any aspect of a corporation which has not been called in the question for its effectiveness except the board. I don't know of a single authority that has ever raised the possibility of eliminating the corporate board. It's a good thing. That doesn't mean that every board is a good thing. But the concept, the idea of a board, is absolutely essential. It's recognized to be valuable to a corporation. If it isn't, it's because they put stupid people on it. But the idea, there's nothing wrong with the board. Now, I want to raise a conjecture. If the board is such a marvelous idea for the CEO, why isn't it a very good idea for every manager? So let's start by giving every manager a board. Now we're going to have two questions. Who will be on each board, and what will the boards do? Well, let's not worry about what they do initially. Let's talk about who will be on them. And let's focus on this middle manager for the moment and see how we might handle him. Clearly, if he's got a board, he better be a member of it. It would be ridiculous if he weren't, because then how would the board communicate to him? So he's got to be a member of his board. Right? Equally clear, his boss should be a member of the board. Why? Well, his boss has some authority over him. And if the authority of the boss and the authority of the board come into conflict, you got a problem. So we can solve that by making the boss a member of the board. So we'll bring this boss on the board. That much is obvious. Now, incorporating the concept of participation, the next step is we take every person who reports directly to this manager 
which in this case are these three, and they will be members of the board as well. So this is the board of 1.1. Who's on it? 1.1, his superior, and his immediate subordinates. Every board, except the top and bottom, we'll talk about this separately, will consist of the manager, whose board it is, his immediate superior, the man he reports to, and all those who report directly to him. Now let's just take a look at a couple of the consequences of this. If we look at this manager for a moment, now, he's on his own board, but he's also on his boss's board, isn't he? Because his boss's board will contain all of his boss's immediate subordinates, right? So he is also on his boss's board. But he's also on the board of each of his immediate subordinates. He is on each of these three boards. So every manager, except the one at the top and the bottom, will be on boards at three levels. His own level, his boss's board, and the board of his immediate subordinates. Now, I know you're starting to worry about when he's going to get his work done, but we'll come to that later. <laughs> we'll deal with that. All right, now here's your second midterm examination. Let's take a big organization like the Navy, not three levels. In other words, it's just a slice out of it. This keeps going up and keeps going down. Each manager participates in boards at three levels. How many different levels of management does he interact with directly? Five. Right. Who said five? How'd you get it? Well, he's got a he's got a another one up above that he sort of reacts with because that guy sits over there with right. Him. And the boss's board, he's got his boss and his boss's boss, two levels above him plus all the people on his own level, right? In the subordinates board, he's got what? One double. Subordinate and a subordinate subordinates. So every manager is interacting directly with all the managers at his level, the two levels above, right? And the two levels below. Now take the highest man in that, okay? His boss's boss, right? So this guy is interacting with his boss's boss. How many levels above that is his boss's boss interacting with? Two. And therefore, this guy has access through this interaction up four levels and down four levels in the organization. Now, this will be important when we look at what the functions of these things are. The point to see <clears throat> first is the amount of interaction vertically through the organization that these boards make possible. The second thing to observe is that in every board you have all the people at the level below that board interacting. So each board makes possible the interactions at the level below it because all these people are on that board and it makes it possible to look at the interactions of this board with four levels up and four levels down because of the people involved. Now what do you do about the top and bottom? Let me take the bottom first. This concept was originally developed about 15 years ago. It did not uh, start a landslide. The first company to use it in the United States was a meatpacking company in the Midwest. It turned out it was a company, in fact, with three levels. The bottom level was the shop supervisor, and these supervisors had an average of 35 people reporting to them. Now, when we created the board, what we wanted to do was give everybody an opportunity to serve on the board, to use the democratic principle. The problem is, if you put these 35 on a board, plus the manager, plus his boss, you got 37 people on a board. And you can't get a board with 37 people in the work. In fact, we know what the maximum number of people is that you can get on an effective board. We found this out in a very curious way. Experimentally, we've known for years that about the maximum size of an effective group is eight people. 
We didn't know why. If you can get up to 10, you'll notice your groups are designed essentially so that they're under 10. But when you get up over 10, you start to run into real trouble. Do you have any idea why? Well, it was a psychologist that told us why, although he didn't know he was doing it. George Miller, a professor of psychology at Harvard, wrote one of the most interesting articles I've ever read about 20 years ago. And it had the best title of any article I've ever seen. It was called On the Magic of Number 7 Plus or Minus 2. <laughs> Isn't that a marvelous title? you got to wonder what it's about. <laughs> what it was about was this. Miller asked, how many different things can you think of at the same time? How many distinct things can you hold in your mind simultaneously? He conducted experiments to answer that question. He found out the average number is seven. The superior person can take nine. The inferior person can only take five. All right, take the average, seven. Now I want to create a group that's highly interactive. The social psychologist will tell you that you can only interact with people that you treat as individuals. Right? How many people can you simultaneously treat, simultaneously treat as individuals? For the average person, it's seven. Seven plus yourself is what? Eight. So ideally, on the average, nobody ought to have more than seven people reporting to them because that's the maximum number he can deal with and treat as the state. Now, if you're a manager of a region for McDonald's, where every McDonald's store is exactly the same, you don't have this constraint, because there's no point of thinking them individually. It's only where each one is doing something different. Therefore, what we would like to have is a board of no more than 10 up here. So we said, okay, the way we'll do it is as follows. We'll get these workers to elect six representatives. There will be six of them on the board, the manager and his boss, that will give us an eight-man board. And we did that. Within a month, all six of the worker representatives who have been elected resigned. <laughs> Can you guess why? Well, they were very open about it. They said the managers treat us as though we're dogs, and the workers treat us as though we're managers. We're caught in a no man's land. We don't know what the hell we are. We just assume we're back with the boys. This is all nonsense anyhow. And then we realized what a terrible mistake we had made. So we went back to the drawing board, and this was just about the time that the concept of the semi-autonomous work group so what the manager said, the trouble is these work groups are too big. We want to break them up into four groups of eight each, approximately. Instead of 35, you have groups of eight or nine each. The manager said, oh my God, you're going to multiply the number of managers by three. You're going to have four managers for every one. We said, no, we're going to have zero managers for every one. He said, we don't understand. We said, we're not going to have managers for these groups. If these are semi-autonomous work groups, then they will elect their own leader. And that leader will be first level of management. Now, the first level of management, in your sense, will have eight groups reporting to them. But eight groups of 64 people, right? So you reduce the number of managers by half. Well, this was installed. Now look what happens. Every employee is a member of his boss's board. Okay? The boss is and the boss's boss. And that's been going for over 10 years now without any problem at all. Because that's a meaningful board. Now, what happens at the top? Well, that varies by the size of the organization. There have been a lot of variations. There are two basic concepts. Clearly, the boss is on the top and the second level is on the top floor. Ideally, if you're talking about the Navy, for example, the Navy is not the ultimate. There's something above it. Pentagon or Secretary of Defense or whatever it is, he ought to be on the board as well. Also, any external stakeholders who are critical to the organization. That can be true at any level of board. 
In a decentralized corporation where these are divisions, they will frequently bring outsiders in because they can contribute to the decision making that goes on at the board. So this board is the intersection of the organization with its environment, and it has to be designed to provide a view down into the organization and out into the environment. Okay, okay that's composition. Now what do the boards do? Well, let's take a look. Five functions. Now when I say this is what they do, this is what they ought to do ideally. And the hundreds of companies that are now using this in one form or another, there are no two of them that are exactly alike, and I'll show you how they've been installed and some of the variations. I'll give you the ideal version now. One thing these boards do is set policy. They are policy-making bodies. But they do not make decisions. These are not managing committees. They are policy-making boards. What's the difference? What's the difference between a decision and a policy? Come on. You policy is a goal. No, policy is not a goal. Policy is guidance. Policy is a rule for making decisions, but not a decision. For example, corporation says we will only promote from within. That's a rule. It's not a decision. When you promote somebody, that's a decision. The manager continues to make the decisions, who to hire, who to fire, what to pay them. But the rules that he abides by, the legislation, is made by the boards. It makes the rules of the game. Second thing that the board does, it plans. It prepares plans in a way that we'll talk about in a little bit. <laughs> It's a planning board, as well as a policy-making board. Third function, it coordinates the activities of the units below it. This board, I'm sorry, this board here, will coordinate these units. Now, who's the majority of that board? The heads of these units, right? Therefore, coordination becomes self-coordination with the participation of two higher levels of management. So coordination is a function of the board to make sure that the activity of different units at the same level mesh together well, that they interact effectively. Is it an equal vote or is it a weighted vote? I haven't talked about voting at all yet. I'll talk about that in a moment. The fourth function is integration. Coordination is the interaction of units at the same level. Integration is the interaction of levels at different uh, units at different levels. It's the vertical dimension. Coordination is the horizontal one. I already showed you how at every board. You have people who are sitting on two levels higher and two levels below, so you've got a view, a direct view of five levels of the organization. The rule is that no board can pass a policy or make a plan which is incompatible with a higher level plan or policy. Hierarchy is preserved. But suppose this board up here stupidly enacts a policy which is great for them but does hell for me down here. What can I do about it? Well, I got a guy on my board who's participating in that board, and so I can raise my point of view at that level. Furthermore, when policies are made, you've got people who have the vision down and the vision up so they can see the impacts, and therefore they take the vertical impacts into account. You know, the administrators of my university absolutely never think at all about the impact of what they do on the department. Because there's no way, they couldn't be that stupid, you know. It just has to be neglect, not stupidity. They just don't think about the effects of what they do down at the departmental level. Why? Because there aren't any departmental people up there. But that couldn't happen in here. Because there would be departmental people there, and they're calling to their attention what those impacts are. Now, it's the fifth one that really makes everybody's hair stand on it. So I'll warn you about this in advance. 
<laughs> it's the one which has been used in the smallest percentage of the case. All of these four uh, are very commonly in these boards. It's the fifth one that makes most people say, well, I won't do it if I got to do the fifth one. Uh, if I can do it without that one, we'll do it. Okay. The board has a responsibility for evaluating the performance of the manager who reports to it. Now let's see what that means. This board evaluates the performance of that manager. He cannot hold that job without the approval of his board. Now the board cannot fire him, but the board controls the position, not the person. This board can move him out of that job. They can't fire him. Only his boss can fire him. Right? Therefore, he can only hold his job if he's got the approval of his boss, because his boss can get rid of him, and the approval of his board. But who's the majority of this board? It's the board. <clears throat> Therefore, in this system, no man can hold a position of authority without the approval of those that he exercises authority over. And that's what democracy is. Now, it's fascinating to watch how frightened people are of it. If that's democracy, they say we don't want it. <laughs> In fact, it's quite common, I, it's been happened many, many times when I present this to corporate executives, they say that's communism. Isn't it fascinating how we now identify democracy with communism? <laughs> and nothing to do with communism. Communism has to do with who owns the means of production, not how you govern. Democracy has nothing to do with who owns the means of production. You have a democratic communism. In an undemocratic communism, you can have a democratic capitalism and an undemocratic capitalism. They're entirely different concepts. Democracy and capitalism have nothing necessarily to connect them. It's a separate decision. But in this type of an organization, everybody is as responsible to the parts of the system he runs as he is to the larger system of which he's a part. You see that? The board is the instrument for the system's view of the organization. Okay, now let's just take up a couple of the issues that arise with regard to it. How are we doing? I've got to check my schedule here. Can we break at 12.15, about 15 minutes? Let me first take up the obvious question on time. When the hell are they get their work done? If the manager's got eight subordinates, that's eight boards, plus his own board, plus his boss's board, is ten boards. Now, I, to answer that question, I want to tell you a story. The uh, chief executive of the company that first employed these boards, a man by the name of John Cry, this was the Cry Meatpacking Company, which later was bought by another company. That company had lost money for 11 consecutive years. It was a family-owned business, but it was the fourth largest meat packer in the United States at the time. In the first year in which they operated with a circular organization, and that's what this is called, a circular organization or a democratic hierarchy, they made money, and a lot of money. Now, it wasn't just because of this. That would be foolish. <coughs> Conditions were right but they never would have been able to exploit those conditions with their old organization. So old John got very excited. He went around all over town bragging about this new organizational structure and what miracles it performed. As a result of this, he was invited by the local club of CEOs, the city in which they operated, had such a club, to make a presentation. That scared the pants off. He didn't mind talking about it informally, but he didn't want to give a formal talk. And they pressed him, and he finally agreed on the condition that the university uh, consultants who had helped him do this would be able to be present to handle any questions he couldn't handle. They agreed to that. Well, John was really upset about this thing, so he insisted we come and make it, put him through some rehearsals. And what we had to rehearse is his answer to questions which would come from the floor. And we said to him, the first question you're going to be asked, John, 
is when you have time to get your work done. And so we then primed him for this. And sure enough, when he made the presentation, the first question he was asked was, when are you going to get your work done? Let me tell you what he answered. Of course, he'd been programmed for all this. He said, I'm going to answer you in two ways. Uh, he said, I'll explain the difference after I'm done. He said, first of all, how often does a board meet? He says, none of our boards meet for more than four hours a month. He says, some boards meet only once a quarter, like the corporate board does. But he says, let's take the maximum, four hours a month. If I'm on 10 boards, that's 40 hours a month, right? He says, now, if I only worked a 40-hour week, and we know that in the United States, on the average, managers work 57 hours. But let me cut it down to 40. That's 160 hours. And therefore, the boards would take up no more, at the absolute limit, than 25% of my time. Now, we say, there have been a number of studies done year after year on how managers spend their time. He said, what do you think is the largest percentage of time managers have ever been to observed to spend in managing? You want to guess at that number? You're going to be shocked at this one. 17%. Managers do not manage for more than 17% of their time. The other things may be important and useful, but it's not managing. They manage only about 17%. He said, let me take the maximum. Okay? So I add those two together, it's 42%. He said, you see, you asked me the wrong question. He said, the real question is, what the hell am I doing with the rest of my time? <laughs> he said, now that's the wise guy answer. Now let me give you the real answer, he said. When I participate in these boards, for whatever the percentage of time is, what am I doing? He said, I am setting policy for my subordinates. We are preparing plans. We are coordinating the activity below. Integrating activity vertically through the organization, and I'm evaluating the performance of my subordinates, and they're evaluating me. What the hell is left? That is management. He said, that's where I do what I'm supposed to do. Whatever else I'm doing is incidental and supportive. He said, the board is an instrument which enables me to manage effectively. That was his answer. Now, a few words about how these things have been set up. They've been set up every conceivable way. I will describe three of them to you, which represent three extremes. There's one corporation, a very large one, where the CEO at the top got very excited about this idea and decided to install it. But he didn't want to put it all the way through the organization at once. He wanted people to buy into the idea. So what he did is he took the eight vice presidents who reported to him and created a board and explained the whole thing to them and set it up. Now the first question they said is, you know, that's fine except for that evaluation. We have no power over you. He said, yes, you do. And he reached in his pocket and he gave them an undated but signed resignation. He said, anytime you collectively decide you don't want me as CEO, just hand this in, put a date on it. I took guts and also a great deal of self-assurance in his confidence. So he set up this board to do all those things. At the end of the year, there was a board meeting, and he said to them, gentlemen, he said, uh, we've tried this board concept for a year. Uh, we got to decide now whether we want to continue this or not. Do you like it? And they looked at him and said, are you crazy? It's been marvelous. We have learned more in this year about the nature of general management than we ever have before. It's great to be able to participate in making decisions that are effective. Of course we like it. You can't stop it. He said, well, I don't understand something. And they said, what do you mean? He said, if it's so good, how come you don't have a board? <laughs> what do you think happened in the next month? <laughs> right? It took about two years and went right smack down to the bottom of the organization. One same principle. 
We didn't have to force anybody to do it. Everybody sold themselves on it, and it just moved down systematically step by step. That's one pattern. Let me take a second. The Ministry of Public Works in Mexico is now the Ministry of Human Settlements and Public Works, but at this time, which would have been about middle 1970s, was the Ministry of Public Works, and it's the largest ministry in the Mexican government. The structure is, again, let me use this figure. There's the Secretary of Public Works. This is called SOP, Secretariat Obras Publicas, which means Secretary of Works Public. There's a secretary, who at the time was a man by the name of Bracamantes, and three deputy ministers or secretaries. The one that's critical here is the one in charge of operations, who was a man by the name of Felix or in English, Felix, that's his last name. Under him, there are a number of departments, and the head of the third level are called Director Generals. All three levels are appointed by the President of Mexico. They're appointed positions. There was a young man in charge of the equipment division by the name of Dr. Carlos Moran. And he got excited about this concept of organization. His division had 35,000 people in it. They bought all the construction equipment used by the government of Mexico, which was extensive in building roads, bridges, dams, everything you can think of. They operated the equipment, they maintained it, and so on. He set up this kind of an organization here, but before he did, he went to see his boss, Felix, and explained to him what he wanted to do and said, I'd like you to be a member of my board. Felix said, look, that looks like an interesting thing. If you want to do it, fine, but I got more than enough to do, so count me out. Well, Moran gave up on that. He set up his own board that considered himself and the subordinates, but he didn't have a superior one. And he set up this way. And I'm not going to tell you what happened. I want to tell you a consequence. Four years later, a new president came in. Lopez Portillo replaced Echeverria. When Echeverria came in, he moved everybody at the top three levels of this ministry out and replaced them, except two people. He kept Felix and Moran. Now, a couple of interesting things immediately happened. Felix said, my God, I'm the only deputy minister retained. Why did he keep me? What do you think the answer was? It must have something to do with Moran. What the hell's that guy been doing? So he goes down to see Moran and he says, you better show me what you've been doing because I suspect I was kept because of it. And Moran explained all this to him and he got very excited, Felix did. When the other director generals in Felix's subsecretariat were appointed, he made damn sure they installed the same system. Okay. Now we get two other deputy secretaries appointed. They come in, what do you think the first question they asked themselves was? Why was Felix retained? And the only thing they can see that's significantly different about him is the way he's got the thing organized. So within a short time, the thing spread throughout the entire organization. There it started in the middle, worked across and up. The third case, and this happened, is where a unit at the very bottom will start and organize itself that way. And then if it succeeds, as it usually does, it will begin to spread horizontally and gradually vertically. This will normally take a lot longer than the top down, but it has happened that way as well. So the answer to the very critical question that always comes up is, where is the best place to start this? What's the answer? Wherever you are. Wherever you are, you can start it. Okay. Let me pause there now. we got a few minutes before we break for lunch to see if you got any questions about this concept. <laughs>